The World Tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Well, greetings, friends. This is Herbert W. Armstrong with the good news of the world tomorrow. My friends, what's going to happen in this world? What's the real meaning of this world chaos, of the upset conditions that we find all about us in the world? What's the real meaning of the fact that it is now possible to lay waste an entire continent in one night without warning? And that means that our enemies have that power and that ability. We're not very much concerned here in the United States. We don't dream of our danger. We've gotten so accustomed to it now, we've become callous. We seem to think that it's just always been like this. It never has been. There is a meaning for present world conditions. What is it? I've mentioned a good many times, my friends, that there is a purpose being worked out here below. And it certainly is true, and very few people know what it is. Now, Bible prophecy tells us exactly what's going to happen, and the Bible explains the meaning of it all and why we're in the stage of conditions that this world is in now. What does it mean? My friends, it is a part of the purpose being worked out here below. But what's it all about? What's brought about that purpose? Why are we in such a time now? Why is God allowing it? He could stop it, you know. God has the power to stop it. God is love. Why doesn't he stop it? Why does he allow world war? Why does he allow all this human suffering? We need to know the answer. Why is it that we're interested in everything else except why we are? Why were we put on this earth? What's the purpose of life? Where are we going? Where are we going to end up? What's it all about? What are we? Why are we? What are the laws that regulate it? Why don't we have world peace? What is the way to peace? We don't seem to know. Why don't our world leaders know how to bring us world peace? They don't know. They don't bring it to us. It all gets back to a false religious concept, and that's why this world is in such ignorance. It seems that we're willing to look into everything else but the truth, the things that are most vital, that are closest to our own personal well-being, our own lives, yes, our own future. It's about time we were concerned about it, because you're living in this world, my friends, and you're going to go right on living in the times that are coming. And it's about time we knew what they are and why and whether there's a way of escape from some of the horrifying things that are coming. What is the conception of this world about it all, about life, about how we came to be here, about God, about religion? A very popular concept, it isn't the only concept, I don't say it's universal at all, but a very common and a very popular concept, which is a basic approach to religion and the uh, ideas of government, of society, and of life in general, and of the relationship of one to the other, is something like this, that God is a creator, if we believe in God at all, Yes, uh, we don't know much about God. We don't know what God looks like. We haven't seen him. As the astronomer said, he's swept the heavens with his telescope, but somehow he's never found God. Uh, he, uh, he just didn't see him. God wasn't visible. But most people believe that God is a person or a trinity or something if they believe in God. Their conception is very vague, and of course a good many people devote a lot of time trying to hatch out some conception from their own human imaginations of what they suppose God is like. In other words, it's the God they're creating themselves. They would like God to be just what they made him, and he isn't, of course. But they believe that, uh, if they believe in God, that he did uh, create things once upon a time and the long ago. But creation is a finished work, 6,000 years ago, and God's work was finished. And he was all through. He had nothing more to do. God merely created the earth and man upon it, but he left it for mankind to work out and to establish uh, their own society, uh, their own form of, or forms of government and civilization and all that sort of thing. Uh, of course, God created the earth and the ground and left it for man to find out how to grow food and things that he would need and to develop a system of agriculture a system of commerce and of industry and of government and the regulating of things. And most people think that 
God, of course, had finished his work when he created man. And so, therefore, God has gone way off. He hasn't been concerned about a sense at all. And uh, even though this world may not have been directly set in motion by God, uh, and it certainly isn't God's world, but then most people seem to somehow think, if they think at all, they probably don't think much on it, but they sort of take for granted that God intended for man to just work out his own pattern the way that would seem right to a man. That's what God intended. And that God is not, in any sense, of course, a direct ruler, but that would never occur to the average person that God is a direct ruler in the affairs of mankind now, why, why no, God, uh, God's business was creating, and he went off, he finished his work, he was all through, and he left it for man to do everything else. And, of course, to, he gave us intelligence, we ought to know how, and man's way should be the right way, that uh, God was concerned only with, uh, well, now, with getting man saved. And how did that come about? Well, the general idea, or a very popular idea, it's not the only one, you may not believe this, but a lot of people do, that God created man perfect. Now, man was created in God's image. He was a spiritual, immortal soul. He was perfect, and God intended him to be perfect and remain that way forever. So that's why God went way off, you know. Well, then Satan entered into the Garden of Eden, and he did uh, upset the apple cart, as we say. Satan uh, entered in, and what did he do? He caused a great big wreck. He caused a big smash-up in this perfect man that God had created, and so they say there's the fall of man. Well, now one of two things had to happen about that time. Either Satan came in when God wasn't looking, and God didn't intend the devil to ever come in, and God certainly couldn't have intended the man to fall, could he? No, they say we can't hold God responsible for that. Why, why, why God is good. God couldn't have planned that. So therefore, the only way left is that the devil uh, got in somehow when God wasn't looking. And uh, for the minute, the devil was more powerful than God, because uh, uh, God had, uh, although he says his purpose stands forever, nevertheless, if it was God's purpose that the man should be perfect, and he had made him perfect, and that he should go along perfect in this world, why, the devil upset that. Now, you have no alternative, my friends. If the devil did come in and do this thing, and God didn't intend it, then the devil did upset God's purpose, and he was more powerful than God. And the only alternative is to just lay the responsibility right at God's doorstep. Then God understood it was going to happen, and, uh, and certainly permitted it, even though he might not have directly caused it. And uh, anyway, uh, the common idea is that finally God looked down and saw what the devil had done in this fall of man, and here was man all lost and cut off from God. Now... Uh, God had to do something about that. Of course, God had not intended, apparently, to ever have anything more to do with the running of the world. Uh, he created it and left it to man to set up government and authority and all that sort of thing. But, but God did become interested in trying to repair the damage. Now that the damage had been done, and uh, now that uh, man had fallen, God had to think out some plan to repair the damage and to restore man back to a condition as good as Adam was before the fall, as good as God had created Adam in the first place. Because now man had fallen. There had been a big wreck here in what God had created, or in modern language, what he had manufactured. And like a, an automobile manufacturer that had manufactured a very beautiful car and gotten a wreck just outside the factory door of the man taking factory delivery of his car, and the factory says, well... Let's have it towed back in here. If we were able to manufacture and make the car in the first place, maybe we can repair the damage. Now, a lot of people think that redemption is merely God's pitiful effort, and it must be a pitiful effort, according to the common conception, to repair the damage that Satan did and restore man back to a condition as good as he was, as good as God had made him in the Garden of Eden before the fall. And, of course, they look out over the world. They feel that God, of course, uses all of the various uh, churches. And some people think he uses not only just the Christian churches, but all of the religions. There are some that feel that uh, these are all God's religions, all the religions of the world, and all of the uh, various uh, branches and denominations and segments and 
divisions in uh, Christian religion, and uh, just, of course, it uh, doesn't make much difference. Join the one of your choice. It uh, doesn't make any difference. All going to the same place anyhow. And indeed they are. But uh, the world doesn't look on God as having any concern whatsoever in the direct rule of this world. And my friends, that's where God has been terribly misrepresented. You know, Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Listen, the Lord is a master, a ruler. A Lord is one who rules over the one he is Lord of. How can you call Jesus Lord and do not the things he says? Today, there are millions of people that use the word Lord all the time, and often they use it where they should not use it, because in the Old Testament sense where you find the word Lord, it, it comes from the Hebrew consonants Y-H-W-H, which uh, no one knows, I guess, exactly how to pronounce it. The name has been virtually lost, but translated into the English language, it has meaning. And it's the name of the one who became Jesus Christ, not the meaning of, of the name of the Father alone, except that the Son did come in his Father's name. And in one or two places in the New Testament, you find the word referred to where it does refer to the Father, but in most cases it refers to the one that was born of the human virgin Mary and became the Lord Jesus Christ, believe it or not. Just check up in your New Testament where it mentions a quotation of the Old Testament where that word occurred, and it is applied to Jesus Christ in so many places. You'll be shocked if you just make a little examination in your own Bible. But, of course, most of us have been too busy with the pleasures and the concerns of this world to have much time for the things of God. Well, now, my friends, people today say, Lord, this, and uh, they serve the Lord, they say. But they serve the Lord doing what they think's right. They don't forsake their ways. Now, the Word of God says that if you want to know how to find the eternal, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. But people today don't want to do that. They want to profess Jesus. They want to exalt him. They want to call him Lord, Lord, but they do not want to do the things he says. Jesus rebuked people for that. He says, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, making the law of God of no effect. By your traditions, God has a law. God rules by his law. God is the supreme ruler of the universe. And God Almighty has ruled that at the present time, you must choose between right and wrong. God has set it before us. He says here in the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, he says here in the first verse, It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee. God has set curses before us as well as blessings. Now listen, verse 15. He says, See, I have set before thee life on the one hand and good, and death and evil on the other. In that I command thee this day to love the eternal thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments. Isn't he a ruler then? Isn't God the one who does the ruling? Is he not a sovereign? Is he not a divine king? If he has given us laws and says we should do it, that we should obey him and keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, why should we keep his laws? Why, they aren't good for us, are they? Why, God says here that you should do it, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the eternal thy God who shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear. Now that certainly means he made us in such a manner that he allows us to turn away. He commands us to go his way, but he allows us to go the other way. And that's all explained here in verse 19. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I... Now notice what God... God has authority. God is the creator, and God is also ruler. And God says that I have set before you life and death. God set the two before us, not one. God does not force you to do right. God has set life and death before you today, my friends. Blessing and cursing, therefore choose. God Almighty is the one who has said we have to choose, and he will not choose for you. Listen, I'm not trying to cram anything down your throats. I'm not trying to just force any religion on you, and God is not. 
and God will not allow the devil to. God has made you so that you are forced to make your decision. God is the ruler, and God has ruled that you must make the decision. If you try to avoid making it, you automatically make it in the negative. You either make it in the positive, or you have automatically made it in the negative. You will make a decision. You are making your decision right now, my friends. And God has made you so you have to make that decision, and he will not make it for you. He will not cram his religion down your throat. He will not allow anyone to. You know, you can. they say that you can lead an old mule to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, now, there are a lot of things that... Perhaps pressure groups, or perhaps if we had a wrong government today, like some nations have had back in time past, when they would uh, all you uh, before some court or some uh, judging body because of your religion. And they would say, look, you've got to believe what we tell you to believe, or we'll start going to work on you, and we will torture you, and we'll keep on torturing you till you die. Yes, someone might have the power to take our bodies and begin to torture them. They might have the power to kill you, but they haven't the power to control your mind. And if you're willing to take the punishment, there is no power on earth and no power in heaven that can or will, or that has the power to make you believe their way. There were millions, millions, just millions of real Christians that believed same things that you find in your Bible today. And there were powers of the secret police of a government, a pagan government, that tried to force them to give up the belief of God and the Bible, and tried to force them to believe the pagan religions of the time. They wouldn't do it. And they never were able to make them do it either. Yes, they killed them. They died. You'll read about them over there in the 17th chapter of Revelation. They're the martyrs of Jesus. you read of them also in the 16th chapter. They are the martyrs who paid with their lives rather than believe anything false. There is no power in heaven or earth that can make you believe anything you don't want to believe. The inner workings of your mind, as God set your mind, my friends, are under your own control. And nobody else does or can control your mind. You remember the broadcast I had here, it was about Job. The meaning of the book of Job. There was the devil coming before God about Job. And God deliberately put the thought in the devil's consciousness to try to do something to Job. So God gave the devil permission, direct deliberate permission, to go down and afflict Job, but he couldn't lay hand on his person. The devil had argued that Job was loyal to God and was the most righteous man on earth because it paid him to be righteous because he had a lot of wealth. The, the devil always does argue that material wealth and possession, money and that sort of thing is the main thing that will make you happy. And he has most people in, around the United States today believing it. And uh, so uh, God gave the devil permission, but the devil could only do what God permitted. He gave him permission to strip Job of all his wealth and even his children. But Job still maintained his own righteousness and his integrity. So when the devil came back, God says, Well, if you notice, Job, I, I let you take away his wealth. You argued that was all there was to it that kept him righteous because it paid him. It, it, it was selfish. It paid him to be righteous. I let you take away everything he had, but you didn't control his mind, did you? Well, Satan says a man will give even everything he has for his own skin. But let me afflict him now, and, and he'll turn around and curse you and turn the wrong way. Well, God says, all right, I will give you a right, I'll give you permission to go down there and afflict the man, except spare his life. You can't kill him. You can go within an inch of his death, but you can't take his life. The devil could only do what God permitted, and God permitted him to do it. Still, Job maintained his righteousness. The devil could not, no matter what he did, change Job's mind. Now, God changed it by showing Job the truth later. But Job had to make his own decision, and he did. And when Job did, and when Job repented, which means change the mind, Job changed his own mind, finally, because there was one thing wrong with Job, and the devil couldn't find it. 
If you remember that program, I brought it out, and that was a lot of conceit, a lot of spiritual pride. He thought he was so good that he was better than anybody else, and that very pride was a colossal sin. Well, now God says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I, God is the ruler, God is doing this thing, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose, but what God said to choose is life. Now, God has made you, so you have to choose. And by the very fact, my friends, that God made you, so you have the ability to choose not only, but you also are forced to choose, that means that you can choose wrong and that God allows you to go your own way. That God does not force you to go his way. He merely forces you to decide which way you shall go. Now, that's what God did to the whole world. And I tell you, we've had this whole thing wrong. God is working out a purpose here below, and the world does not understand that purpose. The religions of this world do not understand the purpose of God. I speak by the authority of Jesus Christ. It's the highest authority in the universe, and all power in heaven and in earth has been given to him. And he has called me and given me authority to represent him and to speak in his name, by his authority. And I do speak with authority and by that authority. If I'm not sure I'm right, I just keep silent. I don't know everything there is to know. But the things I don't know, I don't talk about on the air. I don't tell you. I do speak with authority, but I'm not interested in trying to cram it down anybody's throat. You know, the truth of God is so precious that if you don't hunger and thirst for it, if you don't want it, you're not worthy of it, and you shouldn't have it. It's too valuable to try to force it on anybody, and God won't do it, and no real uh, servant of God would ever do it. Oh, no. It's just like something that's very, very valuable. If I were going to give you a billion dollars, you'd think that was really valuable. What would you think of me if you didn't want it and I tried to force it on you? No, if I'd say, here it is, come and get it if you want it. And that's what I do say about the truth of God. But let me remind you of something, my friends. And you've heard me say this so many times, and I repeat it right now. Don't believe me. I'm not trying to get followers. I don't crave any following. There are plenty of men in this world that want a following. They want to exalt themselves. They want to make themselves a leader over others. I certainly do not. I don't seek any following whatsoever, but God has merely called me to make the truth available and to make it plain. It has been hidden under a rubbish heap of pagan superstition for eighteen and one half centuries, and God has prophesied that he would have this truth sent to all the world in these days, and it's going. No matter how many scoffers there may be, the truth is going out, and it's a witness against them. And God has said that this truth is to go into all the world as a witness unto all nations, not to cram it down their throats, not to make them believe it. You make your own decision. I merely make the truth available, and I wouldn't move a little finger, I wouldn't move a hair to try to force you to believe it. Couldn't do it if I wanted to. And God has shown me that I shouldn't, that I shouldn't want to. Now, I will confess that when God had first called me and first brought me to conversion, the first thing I thought was that, I wanted to get all of my family and all of my relatives and my best friends. Uh, I wanted to get them converted. I wanted them to have the truth, and I did everything I could to force it on them. And I found that the more I tried to force it on them, the harder they ran away from it. And so I've had to learn a few lessons, and God has shown it to me both in his word and also uh, by experience. And so I don't try to do that anymore. If someone wants to uh, get into a contention, a debate, or an argument, I have no time for debates or arguments. I merely preach the truth. And it, my friends, it's on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. It's very precious if you want to take it. And for people who are really hungry for the truth, who are willing to let God Almighty rule their lives and let him correct them where they're wrong, and that's what the Bible will do. The Bible is God's revelation, and it is profitable to correct us and reprove us. And if you're willing to be corrected and reproved where you're wrong, if you're willing to admit it, if you sincerely and honestly seek truth, you want to be taught, you want the truth, I'll give it to you, and then I'll tell you, don't believe it because I gave it to you, but you go to your Bible, and you search the Scriptures whether these things are so, and if you find it so, believe it because you see it in your Bible, the Word of God, and believe it because God says so, not because Herbert W. Armstrong said so. 
Now, I say, listen to me like that. Listen to everybody, your own preacher, no matter who you listen to. Listen to them the same way. They should be willing to say the same thing. You shouldn't follow any man. Follow God. Follow the Word of God. Don't trust any man. The Bible tells you not to put your faith, your trust, your hope in men, but in God. But to have charity for men. Now, what do we want to do? We want to start trusting men and... uh, then not having any charity for them. We trust some men and we get intolerant and uh, bigoted and uh, all that sort of thing against others and want to persecute others and want to hate them. Now, God says we should love even our own enemies and we should have patience and tolerance with people and you aren't going to find very many that will agree with you and everything. Can you love them just the same? Maybe you don't agree with what you hear on this program. Why, my friend, most of you are not going to agree with it at first. And let me say once again, If I preach to you just what you already believe, if I preach just the popular things that everybody already believes, well, the most you could say is that I'm amusing and entertaining you, and I doubt very much whether my speaking voice has as much musical quality in it and is as entertaining to listen to as some beautiful music of some kind, or if you prefer jazz music or hillbilly or western or whatever you like, you you might enjoy that a lot more. And uh, this is not an amusement program. This is a program to stimulate thought and to make you think because that's what God wants me to do because you have to make your decision and you should only make it on thought and on knowledge of all the facts. A wise business executive doesn't make decisions on snap judgment. He should get all of the facts and be in possession of all of the factors concerned before he makes a decision. Making decisions is a very important thing if you're at the helm of a major industry or a big business or, let's say, for the President of the United States. Next time, if you vote for a President of the United States, let me tell you the main factor for you to look at. Don't look so much at his politics or so much at how you like his looks or things like that. You look to the ability of that man to make wise decisions because that's the most important thing the President of the United States has to do. He has to make decisions on which a lot of your welfare and mine depends. And the most necessary thing is to know that you have a man of wisdom that can make wise decisions. Most of us never think about that. And I I, I don't think you hear the politicians very often telling you that you should look to that and trying to know who who should be the president. Look to his heart, too, whether his spirit and heart and attitude is right and how sincere he is, and whether he has a mind that can grasp all of the factors and make a level-headed, wise decision. You better look to a man that is looking to God for wisdom, because if he doesn't, he isn't going to have it. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. For literature offered on this program, send your requests along with the call letters of this station to Herbert W. Armstrong. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.